Uh, on uh, Monday, we always have a study at Panera Bread, at least uh, that's the, the normal thing. And last week, we studied together from Mark chapter 9. And uh, especially, I wanted to uh, emphasize, we studied from the, the latter part of the chapter, which begins in verse 33. And there were some things that we talked about in that study that I would like to kind of talk about today with you. Uh, because I thought the lessons of that chapter were excellent, and, uh, and, and maybe I can expound on some things I didn't have a chance to expound upon during the class. So if you will, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, and we'll begin to read in verse 33. Mark chapter 9, and begin in verse 33. Uh, on this occasion, Jesus had uh, was speaking to his apostles, and uh, we see them coming back from Capernaum. Let me just get there real quick. Beginning in verse 33, hear the words that are spoken. It says, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began questioning them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him or he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him. For there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whatever or whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes to stumble, it will be better for him if the heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he be cast into the sea. And we'll pause with that reading right there. It's an interesting section of scripture. The Lord with his disciples had returned to Capernaum from Caesarea Philippi where he had promised the keys of the kingdom to Peter in Mark chapter 8 verses 27 through 30 and also where he had honored Peter, James, and John by a mysterious trip up the mountain. And furthermore, to enhance this mysterious trip, he told these three they were not to tell the others what they had seen on the mountain. They had seen great things. They had seen the Lord transfigured, if you'll recall, with Moses and Elijah. But the Lord says, don't tell anyone until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And in my opinion, it, were, it was these events, or and events like these, which really starts the discussion that the apostles were involved in on the way back to Capernaum. And that is, who is the greatest among them? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And that's what they were discussing on their way back to Capernaum. And when they get back to Capernaum, the Lord asked them, what were you talking about? What were, what were you discussing among yourselves? Now, there's no question in my mind the Lord knew what they were discussing. But He wants them to tell Him what they had been discussing. But Mark says, they kept silent. And I believe they kept silent because they were embarrassed about what they had been discussing along the way. So the Lord sits down, as it was the custom in those days for teachers to sit while they taught. The Lord sits down and He calls the others to Him. He calls all the others to Him and He says to them, If anyone wants to be first. Now, to be first, to be first is a reference to rank. And it really gets to the core of of the discussion that was taking place among the disciples. He says, whoever wishes to be first, he says, uh, among you shall be last of all and servant of all. Now, to be last of all and servant of all denotes a willingness to put other people before you, or in their case, before themselves. And uh, that's what he was talking about. It meant that they were to be servants of other people. 
Now, this is the Lord's word regarding how He determines greatness in the kingdom of God. They were discussing who is the greatest. And the Lord said, here is how I determine it. Here is how greatness is achieved. He says, to, he says you must be, to be first, you must be last of all, and servant of all. So this is the Lord's word regarding how He determines greatness, how He determines firstness in the kingdom of God. And I ask the question, are we listening to what the Lord is saying here? He says, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Like much of the teaching of Jesus throughout His ministry, the Lord was teaching something that I think was somewhat radical to the thinking of the people in those days, especially the apostles. And because His teaching is so radical, He has to repeat it. He has to repeat it several other times. Sometime He repeats it to the apostles who heard it more than once. And then on another occasion, he, he spoke it in words uh, regarding the Pharisees. Let's look at these scriptures. Turn, if you will, from Mark 9 to Mark 10, verses 42 and following. And he says here in Mark 10, beginning in verse 42, these words. And calling them to himself... Well, let me just go here and get the context here real quick. Peter, or, or excuse me, James and John, through their mother, comes to Jesus... And by the way, the mother of James and John seems to have been an aunt of Jesus, was a kinswoman to Jesus. Somehow they were related together. And I suppose they figured that if they bring the mother along, that the mother can kind of uh, do stuff. You know how mothers are. And maybe she liked this idea, you know, that her boys could be this particular thing. Mothers are somewhat like that. And, and they come to the Lord through the mother who asked the Lord, Can my two sons have the two highest places in your kingdom? Can one sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand? Which in, in their thinking and that way of thinking was the, the, the most privileged place to sit. At the right and left hand of the Lord. And Jesus then tells them that, that this is not for him to give. And then he kind of uh, tells them... Uh, that there's a hard way of, of walking. If they, if they want to follow him, there's a hard road to follow. But, but he pretty much tells them that this is not going to be the case. It's not for me to give this position. Now, what happens then is that the twelve or the other apostles hear about this conversation. Maybe they were witness to it. I don't know, but they hear about it. And so we take up the reading here. In verse 42, where it says here, Calling them, that is the apostles to himself, he says, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So here again, we see this teaching that He said in Mark chapter 9. That greatness in the kingdom of God is not achieved in the way that most people think greatness is, a, is achieved. It is achieved through service. It is achieved by serving other people. Becoming the slave of other people. Serving them from the heart, of course. And then we turn to Matthew 23. And on this occasion, Jesus was really speaking to the Pharisees, but He was speaking in the hearing of many other people. And here's what He says, beginning in Matthew 23. Let me get there in my New Testament. Beginning in verse 6, He says, talking about the Pharisees, they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is Christ. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servants. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. 
So here again we see the teaching of the Lord regarding greatness in the kingdom of God. The Pharisees loved the position of greatness. They loved to be called titles which would somehow exalt them over other people. Which would make them distinguished among others and, and kind of elevate them. They loved those kind of things. To be called rabbi. To be called leader. You know, uh, and again, we could go into a, a discussion about how the religious world still has men like that who like to be called by titles, but that's really a, a, an aside point. What I want to talk about here is how the Lord talks about greatness. It is not achieved in that sort of way. The great people in His kingdom are those who are servants. Those who become slaves of others. And that's what he says, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. The man who puts himself forth as somebody great will be humbled. And he says, and whoever humbles himself, of course, shall be exalted. And then after this, the Lord, again, speaking to his apostles on the night of his betrayal. He's talking to them at the Passover meal. And on such a sober evening. And, and as he is breaking the bread with them, and as he is eating this meal with them, an argument breaks out. And guess what it's about? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Isn't it funny how on such a sober evening, on such a serious occasion, men could only think about themselves. And they start arguing among themselves. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, take up the reading in Luke 22, beginning in verse 24. Luke 22, beginning in verse 24. Jesus speaks. And, uh, and here's what He says. And there arose a dispute among those as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest... And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is greatest among you shall become the, like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For he, or for, pardon me, for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. So here they were arguing about greatness and the Lord once again says, you're talking like Gentiles. You're talking like the people of the world. They love that, these titles and they love to be called by these things. But this is not the way it's going to be among you. Among you, he said, the greater is the one who is like the youngest and the leader is like the servant. In other words, greatness will come about in a different sort of way among those of you who would be my disciples. In the world, greatness is determined by how many people serve you. By how many people you have at your beck and call. And the great make it clear to the rest of us just how great they are. Do you know who I am? Do you know who you're dealing with? Have you ever heard somebody say something like that? And they, they, they make it very clear to you that they're important. And, and you better understand how important I am. That is how the world is, is seeing things. And yet time and time again, Jesus, Jesus teaches that rank or firstness in His kingdom grows out of one's service to others. Or as, as the world judges... This sort of thing, it grows out of one being the last, or the servant, or the least. The least in the kingdom, says the Lord. And, he's, and I think He's really accommodating the speech here. The least, as the world views it, is the greatest, as I view it. That is what the Lord teaches consistently, and this is the way it would be in His kingdom. In the kingdom of the Messiah, humility... And service lead to greatness. And may I say, humility and service are greatness. Are greatness in the kingdom of God. This is the path to service. The one first in thinking of himself shall be last in Jesus' estimation. And he considers the last in self-seeking to be the greatest. 
And, and you know, like He did with every other thing, Jesus practiced what He preached. He says on two of these occasions that we read in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, He said, The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And then again in the verse in Luke 22 and verse 27, He says, I am, among, I am here among you as one who serves. The Lord shows the way. And again, this is something that we want to have burned into our mind regarding greatness. When we go back to Philippians and, and we see Paul uses the, the Lord's service as an example for us. In Philippians chapter 2, he really was talking about the need that we have to, to, to kind of view the other person in a way that, that, that shows them how important they are. Look what he says, beginning in verse 3. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. In other words, don't act from these motives of selfishness or vain glory. And, and I think that may be a warning to those people who are, are pretty uh, like, like the Pharisees, who are trying to be great by this, by feigning service. You know, there are a lot of people who, who try to feign being a servant, feign being least, but really in their heart they feel they're better than everybody else and they view other people with contempt, but they outwardly act in this way. Well, Jesus is saying, that's a selfish attitude. You're acting selfishly and you're acting with vain glory, thinking, you know, thinking, well, I can be this way in order to achieve glory from, among men. And, and he said, don't act this way. But he said, but with humility of mind. That's the attitude we are to have as we serve others. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Regard the other individual more important. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. He says, have this attitude, and here's the example he gives us. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Here he talks about humility and he brings up the best example. Jesus, who was a somebody, he existed in the form of God. And, and again, if you want to try to get your mind wrapped around that concept, go back to the Old Testament visions that men had of God. Isaiah and, and Ezekiel and maybe even the New Testament where we see Jesus sitting on His throne or God sitting on His throne. And go back and, and see those wonderful visions of God on His throne. And what happened when these prophets saw God on His throne? They fell before him and they said, I am unworthy. And woe is me. They thought they were going to die. I mean, that's the form of God that he's talking about, I believe. Where when you would see this and you would fall down and you would worship and you would wonder about whether you were going to live or die because you have seen the Holy One. Jesus was in that form. <laughs> but he took on another form. The form, as he says here, the form of a servant. And here he's talking about ourselves. What we are in is the form of a servant. Flesh and blood. All of us are in that form. And that's what he's saying, that Jesus took on a different form. So when you see him now, what do you see? You see just a fellow servant. You see just another fellow human being who has given up this other form that he had, given up this form of God and took on this form, the form we are now in, he said, and he did this, he said, having taken on this form, it says here, he goes on and he said, having been found in the appearance of a man, he humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Here he takes on our form and then he humbles himself and becomes obedient to the point of death or to death. 
And, and, and then he stresses something that's important, and that is he just didn't die of old age. He didn't become like us to die of old age. He, t- he took on our form, and then he, to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Now the point of Paul is not to talk about why he dies. That's not in what he's talking about. He talks about the purpose of the death in other places. The point of talking about this at this stage is to show what happens after Christ humbled Himself and after Christ lived the life of a servant. What happened? Well, He takes on the form of a servant. He humbles Himself to the point of death. Death on the cross. And then what does God do? Well, look at the next verse again. For this reason, verse 9, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What happens after Jesus' humility? His exaltation. His exaltation. He humbled himself to the point of death, death on the cross, but then God exalts him. And that is his point. He's telling us that we need to be humble. We need to not be selfish in our thinking. We must not do anything from empty conceit. But with humility we are to serve. And it is after this life of service that we will one day or finally be exalted. Not by men, but by God who judges all things rightly. So he uses Jesus as the example of this humility. And that we must be servants, he says. That we must serve, and by doing this service throughout life, God will exalt us. Because God views this as the road to greatness. This is what we need to do. This is the underlying point of what Paul is saying here is that we too will be exalted. And on that final day, after being faithful, we will hear the words from our Lord, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He refers to us as servants. We will enter into the glory, enter into the joy of the Lord. I think that is what the Lord wants us to understand. That greatness is achieved not by carnal means, not by the way the world views achieving greatness, but it is achieved by service. And God's estimation of the servant is what we are after. And His estimation is they are the great ones. They are the ones who will be exalted. Now returning back to Mark chapter 9, after declaring how greatness is determined in His kingdom... The Lord then says in verse 36, or what the Lord does in verse 36 is He takes an object lesson. Taking a child, He stood him in the midst of them. So He gets this child, and He stands him there in the midst of the the twelve, and then He does something else. He picks the child up and sets him in his lap. Now we don't know how old this child is. We don't even know who the child is. Some, and I think this is kind of a cute thought, but some say it may be one of Peter's children. Because he was in Capernaum and and it was quite often they went to Peter's house. I don't know. It's an interesting thought, but not really the important thought. The point is, he takes this child, he sets the child right in the middle of the twelve. And then he, he picks him up and embraces this child. And he says in verse 37, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. Now, I really think that very often we all miss the point of what Jesus is trying to get across here. And I think we miss the point because we sometimes don't appreciate the rank of children back in those days. Now, we live in a time where the children are all kings. And, uh, and we've, we've gone from one extreme to another. We live in a time where the children are the most important thing in the house. And whatever they demand, they get. Which is one other type of mistake. Whereas in those days, the children were seen as the least. 
the least important, the least significant. A child? I mean, a child? I mean, they were not the important one in the family. Now again, there may be, there's obviously a balance somewhere in between. Uh, but, but they saw the child as the least significant individual. Period. And so Jesus takes this child... And, and he says this least significant individual among them and then embraces him. And then he said, whoever receives this child, i.e. this least significant person, in my name he receives me. Now, if you want to have proof that this is really the correct thought... Do you remember what happens in Mark 10? Turn there if you will. In Mark 10, 13 and 14, we see an occasion where it says uh, they begin bringing children to Him, that is to Jesus, so He might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. They rebuked these people for bringing their children to the Lord. And when Jesus saw this, He became indignant. That's a real strong expression of emotion here. He was really upset with these apostles for doing this. He became indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The disciples wished to protect Jesus from what appeared to be an unseemly intrusion and annoyance, at least in their thinking. Children were least... They're not important. Why are you bringing these children to the master? Why are you bringing him to the teacher? They thought that it was beneath the dignity of the Messiah to turn aside from the affairs of the kingdom of heaven to pay attention to children. Children are not important. But Jesus was indignant with their officious interference and he directed that children be brought to him, declaring this, to, that, 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 that to such belong the kingdom of heaven, or to that, that the kingdom of heaven will be, will, be, will be made up of those individuals who are in some way like children. Again, to the thinking of the Jewish Greco Roman world, children were least important. They were to be ignored, they were to be sent away. But what Jesus says. And teaches in Matthew 10 was, don't stop them, let them come. But he's trying to really teach another lesson here about the least. They view them as least. Now getting back to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 37, I think what he says here in these verses is said in part, it is said in part to warn us about the consequences of mistreating the least in the kingdom of heaven of mistreating such individuals. Look what he says in verse 37. If you receive one child like this in my name, it says, you are receiving me. And whoever receives me is not receiving me, but him who sent me. What's the converse to that? If you reject him, you are rejecting me, and you are rejecting the Father. I believe his teaching here is not so much that we should be humble. I think he does teach that in other places. But, it, but Mark's emphasis is what are going to be the consequences? If we somehow rebuke or somehow take the heart out of those people who are servants, who are least in the kingdom... And I really am convinced that's right from what, 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 what the way, because look how John responds to this. In the next verse, and I think this was said in direct res response to what Jesus just said. In the next verse, John says to him, Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him. For there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For he who is not against you is for us. Or against us is for us. So here we see John being taught, that he listening to this message of Jesus about receiving one of these least ones, these servants. 
The ones who the world may consider least, but the Lord considers to be great. And, and we somehow rejecting them. We somehow taking the heart out of them. And so John thinks, wait a minute. There was an occasion, Lord, over here where we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we told him to stop. And Jesus said, you did wrong. He said, you did wrong. Jesus said, stop hindering him. Stop hindering him. The Lord tells these individuals that the one who he has sent to serve must not be hindered by other people who are also his servants. I think that's a thought. There are several cru crucial considerations to be noted before commenting on what Jesus says about this particular event. John, who actually brings this complaint about the man, conceded that the gentleman was actually casting out demons. This was a genuine case of, of, of casting out demons. This was not, he said he was, we saw him casting out demons. This man was doing what they were doing. And he was doing it in the same name that they were doing it in. And I want to suggest to you, I'm not going to get into it now, but we've been studying Acts and we actually uh, uh, had just had some lessons in the book of Acts. I don't think L.A. dealt with this. But the fact is, demons were perfectly capable of distinguishing between those who possess the power to cast out demons and those who merely feign such. Do you recall what happened in Acts 19? I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the devil says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know who you are. Demons were very capable of determining who had the power and who did not have the power. John concedes that this man was doing exactly what they were doing. But in the name of Jesus, and in the name of Jesus as well. There's no evidence that this man was doing any wrong at all. There's no evidence that he was teaching anything different than what they were teaching. John's problem was simple. This man was not part of our group. He didn't say he's a false teacher. He didn't say he was teaching things that were not the same. He simply said he is not part of our company. And therefore I told him to stop. You can't do this anymore. And the Lord instructs His disciples, forbid Him not. And the Greek suggests that He was saying, stop hindering Him. The Savior then explains why this fellow was not to be opposed. He says, no man, no man who is doing a mighty work in my name will be quickly able to speak evil of me. And Jesus then acknowledges in these verses that the man was performing genuine signs and he was doing such in the name of Christ, that is, on the ground of his authority. If this man was actually casting out demons, then he obviously was teaching the gospel because supernatural signs were designed to confirm the truth. You remember the statements in Mark? That they went forth preaching the gospel and the Lord confirming their word by the signs that followed. The purpose of genuine miracles was to confirm the signs. In Hebrews chapter 2, it also brings us out the Lord confirming their word by the signs. This is Hebrews 2, 2 through 4. That's what the miracles were doing. Confirming the teaching. And supernatural gifts would never have been given to authenticate false teaching. Never. So what do we learn from this episode? I think we're forced to conclude that this unknown disciple had on an earlier occasion been associated with Christ in some way. The Lord just didn't send out the twelve to work miracles, you recall. He sent out seventy. And the Lord may have sent out more than that. We don't have a record of everything the Lord did. 
And so, in my thinking, there's no problem in saying the Lord had previously met this man and commissioned this man to do exactly what he was doing, and he was doing what the Lord had told him to do, and he was serving the Lord as the Lord had told him to serve him. And what he tells the apostles, you need to stop and leave him alone. He is serving, you need to leave him alone. You need to do that, and, and you need to stop it. And then he goes on, and I think he gives a reason why. You're not to hinder this man. Look at the next verses and how this all fits together. He says, and I think, he says, Whoever gives a cup of, of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he should not lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if a, with a heavy if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he'd be cast into the sea. In other words, when we see other servants serving the Lord, what are we to do? We're to encourage the servants of the Lord. I am serving the Lord. I see, I see you serving the Lord. I need to encourage you, not hinder you. I need to encourage you. And in this context here, the encouragement would come, I think, in this context here by giving a cup of cold water. Giving refreshment. To another servant of Christ. And, and again, uh, I think he just illustrates the point that we need to hold up the hands of other servants, not to bring them down, not to discourage them by our words or by our actions, but encourage them. That is our task as servants of God, to encourage other servants of God and not to be a hindrance to them. Because if we become a hindrance to them, then look at the consequences. He said, it will be better. It would be better, he said, for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck he had been cast into the sea. It'd be better to die. It'd be better that you die, that you be drowned, than to cause one of these little servants of mine to stumble. And then he goes on in verses 43 through 44 to kind of illustrate how important it is how important it is that we not cause any to stumble. I think he shows to the, to the extent that we must go to to do whatever is necessary not to be a stumbling block to a little one. And the little one he's talking about here are servants. Not children per se, but those who are least. Those whom the world considers as least. And sadly, those whom we sometimes consider to be least as well. I think this is an important lesson. It really is. We we're all need to be servants. That's the first of all. That's what the Lord wants. We are a, a band of servants. Our task is to serve the Lord, and in serving the Lord we serve one another. And we put the interest of others before ourselves. But we also must serve the servants giving them what they need to be refreshed, giving them what they need to, to, to keep on being servants, and not say or do things that would discourage them in their service. For in doing so, we risk our own salvation. In doing so, we risk our own situation with the Lord. Now, I have to confess, the, the last part of this chapter, verses... Uh, 49 and 50, I don't know what those verses mean. Uh, you go and you read what the commentaries say, and they all say, man, this is a hard verse. Nobody knows what this means. And, and, I, and I knew that before I read their comments. I said, well, th what in the world is the Lord saying? Perhaps Brother Johnson is right, who wrote the people's uh, new uh, commentary. His comment was that in these verses, when he says, For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The, the problem verse is 49. Everyone will be salted with fire. His point was, and I think this may be the case, our Lord is alluding to the pervading idea of verses 45 through 48. But these sacrifices of hand, of foot, and eye must be made. Must be made, for everyone will be salted with fire. 
Fire is used in the scriptures to denote suffering, persecution, trial, distress of any kind. Salt is used to denote permanence, preservation from corruption. And so his idea was that that's what we're all going to have to, to make sacrifices as we help other servants to go along. And, and do things that are such. I don't know if that's right. It could be right. If it's not right, I don't know, have a clue of what he's saying here, at least in this context here. I just don't understand. But I do understand what he's saying in these verses. And that is, greatness is achieved not by how many people serve me, but by how often I serve others and how I serve others. And furthermore, that I must be an encourager of other servants. I must be an encourager of others who are attempting to serve the Lord. I must not be a stumbling block to others servants of the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? And there are lots of ways that we can be stumbling blocks to those who are trying to serve the Lord. There are lots of ways that we can take the heart out of other servants. And when we do that, when we do that, the Lord is watching. Because in doing that, we are despising His other servants. And in despising them, we are despising Him and the Father who sent Him. Let us be servants. And let us serve other people who are servants. Let us hold up their hands and let us be an encourager of them and not a discourager. I'm reminded before we close of, of the words that were spoken in, the, in one of the letters. I'm not sure if it was Hebrews or if it was uh, in Peter's letter. But he was talking about the elders. And he said, he says, don't make the elders task. And I think the elders are servants in another way. He said, don't make their task in oversight be uh, an unpleasurable thing. <laughs> and, and I've often seen, or often heard, excuse me, of elders losing heart of shepherding the flock because of other servants not encouraging them and other servants not taking the advice of these men who are serving as shepherds of God. But anyway, that's an, an illustration of how that can happen. But it can happen a lot of ways. We need to make sure that we are doing what we can do. We need to receive admonition from the Lord, from His Word, with, with grace. When we hear instruction, we need to act rightly with that instruction. And we need to encourage those who bring that instruction, whether it be by an admonishment, by an, a rebuke. Well, however, we need to do what's right. We need to be servants and we need to hold up the hands of other servants. That's what he says. I think that's a, a good lesson. Such an important lesson. And we all need to be looking at ourselves and saying, what kind of a servant am I? And how am I, how am I faring in this area of my life? And, uh, and then uh, make corrections if they're needed. Well, that's the lesson for today. And hopefully you've been benefited by it. And if you uh, need to make some corrections in your life and you haven't been faithful to the Lord yourself, then you make it right with the Lord. When I was in Kingsboro, we had a, a woman starting to come to the assembly. And, uh, and she, she saw that it was our habit to offer an invitation. And, uh, and she wondered about this invitation of telling the Christians who had sinned to, to make their confession and, you know, come forward and make their confession or whatever. And, and she said, is that how the Lord requires you to make, make things right with Him, to come forward before the congregation? And I said, no, that's not what the Lord requires. In fact, I said, if you're coming forward to make things right, you need to already be right with the Lord. <laughs> Your coming forward is to, is to ask for help. You, you make yourself right with the Lord before you come forward. You repent and you make corrections in your mind before you come and then you come forward really for prayers and for encouragement to keep your commitment. And that's what we need to do here. Keep that in mind. 
for those who ever come forward, there needs to be a change of mind prior to coming forward. This is not repentance coming up here. And so that's why I say you can make it right with the Lord while sitting down there. If you need prayers, we will pray with you and for you. But we encourage everyone here today to make things right with the Lord. If we have not been the servants we need to be, then make it right. And if you need prayers, we'll encourage you and help you. And if you never have become a servant of the Lord, never have become one of His children, then we beseech you, why delay? Why delay? There's still time. But there won't always be. There won't always be. Come believing in the Lord, repenting of your sins, and being immersed into Him for the forgiveness of sins. And become a child of God. Become a servant of God today as we stand and sing the last song.